the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Morgan Stanley. Thank Michael, thank you very much. <laughs> Makes me want to order a steak, I guess, right? For the beef people. What was that, Magnificent Seven? <laughs> Back in seven, that's we're, we're a few short here. <laughs> we went quality rather than quantity. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for doing this. This has been a bit of a tradition. As you can see, you fill the, the, the room, so people are here to hear your, uh, your thoughts, your insights, your comments, and maybe we'll make a little news today as well. Uh, let's start with this week. Both of you have reported earnings. You've knocked it out of the park this week, so congratulations. <laughs> Uh, Jamie, you were started the week. James, uh, was it yesterday, uh, the day before? So, how, how are you doing? What's your secret sauce? How are you achieving the kind of returns and the kind of uh, uh, numbers that you put up this week? Jamie, we'll start with you. So, welcome everybody. It's thrilled to be here. And uh, you know, I, I really don't pay that much attention to quarterly earnings. You have to report them. You have shareholders, but I think. For most companies, the way you earn money this quarter, the decisions you made over the last 5, 10, 15 years, technology you built, things you inherited. Uh, uh, so you just, we just try to keep on building, you know, branches, people, clients, products, services, you know, unit by unit, business by business over an extended period of time and try, try to create some competitive advantage if you can, which is hard to do in our business. James? I pay a little attention to that quality. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I have to more, but... Uh, uh, listen, it, it was, you know, several years ago we, we, um, we went about de-risking the business model and, and uh, building businesses that had a much more predictable flow. So it, exactly designed for a time when, you know, the markets is caught and, and we, we saw it in all our businesses that they, they, were not, they were not terrible, but they were not terrific. And there's a lot of volatility. There are a few landmines to be dodged and, you know, having some very stable revenues for half of our firm, which we do, just gives us comfort coming into every quarter. We, we kind of know in bad times, things will be fine. In good times, everybody's making money. In bad times, things are fine. And this was, you know, this was not a bad quarter, but it was, it was an okay quarter, and, and you know, the firm performed well. The team, team did a great job. But that, that's, the, that's the ambition, is, is, is not to have the negative surprises we had coming into the financial crisis and the periods after it. We all showed up in Washington this week. The IMF had uh, written down their forecast. The OECD, the other uh, economists have had a fairly dour view of the uh, global economy. We had a board meeting yesterday, 40 CEOs and chairmen sitting around the table. They were somewhat more upbeat. I wouldn't say they were optimistic, but more upbeat than the economists. Why the dichotomy, Jamie? Well, how do you see it? Yeah, I don't know what the economists were saying in total. The world was growing at 3.5 or 3.7%. So I think when a year ago, the IMF thought we might have the fastest year ever. And that's obviously been coming down the whole time to a number like, I think it was like 2.7 or something like that. Remember, that's still $3 trillion of global growth. There's a huge amount of growth. So I, most of us wouldn't look at that as dour. And if, it, and if you're talking CEOs in the United States, the consumer remains quite strong. You their see. balance sheet, their confidence, their spending, wages going up, household formation going up. Uh, it's the business side is a little weaker globally. And business confidence has come way down. You know, businesses pay attention to geopolitics, and, and obviously there's China trade, and China, America, and all that is causing consternation, and starting to change decisions. People are slowing down uh, in certain investments they're making, they're slowing down, figuring out where they want to put supply lines, and so that slowed down the business side. Whether that caused the United States to go into recession? Probably not. Because that 70% is, is almost never let us down when they have the money to spend and wages are going up and people enter the force. So, uh, so yes, global slowdown, it just not be on the way down. It may just be slow down and level off. James, the consumer can carry the U.S. economy, and, and what are you hearing from your clients in the I mean, the, consumer, the consumer's balance sheets are in very strong shape, absent the student lending, which is a, a particularly sort of odious uh, thing that's happened over the last 30 years, the, the amount of debt that these kids have. But uh, consumer balance sheets are strong. Can they carry it? Yeah, until sentiment and emotion changes that. So the risk has been all the headline risk, the endless political, geopolitical discussions, the actual reality of the damage geopolitically relative to any other decade, the last six decades, it's pretty modest, right? We've, we've had real big wars in the last, you know, 100 years. We've had, we've had real geopolitical turmoil. We, we're not in that phase right now. We're, we're in trade dispute phase. 
Um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like Jamie. I mean, we're we're both optimists, and you know, it, it, it's easy to live that way. But I think we're also realists. We've seen a lot of things over a long period of time. It's not that bad right now. But the the headline risk um, bleeding into consumer psyche, bleeding into consumers cutting back on spending. That's when that combined with the corporate cutback. That's when you tip into the recession. By the way, recession itself is sort of a cleansing. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the be all and the end all. It's a question of how deep and how long. The U.S. is running huge fiscal deficits, <clears throat> trillion dollars a year, four and a half percent of GDP at the top of the cycle. Not what you would expect given where we are in the expansion. But no one seems to care about deficits anymore. Is that a mistake? I would tell you that it's, it's not going to cause a crisis immediately, like the next year or two or three. The United States can afford a, a deficit like 80 percent of GDP. Uh, but the mistake would be if we don't realize that down the road it is not completely sustainable. So in America, if you look at that number, 80 percent, they'll go to 90 to 100, and it's a hockey stick. Almost all based on medical entitlements. The increase is all medical entitlements. And you know, obviously, the sooner you deal with it, the better. You know, don't wait for it to. It'll deal with itself at one point. And I remember our 80 percent debt to GDP that compares to Japan, which is like 250 percent. So who you owe the money to? Uh, what you spent the money on, oh, those are important things, but it's not today's crisis. And so I think we have time, whether we ever have the political will. I mean, you've seen Detroit go bankrupt, you've seen you know, big states are, uh, are going to have fiscal problems in other cities, and we know it's happening. It's just a bad idea to watch that train coming down this track, and three or four or five years later, it's going to run you over, and you know it today. So I do think we should react to it. We don't have to be hysterical over it. James, let me ask you about interest rates. Interest rates are low. We see uh, yield curves around the world, which make it problematic for some uh, banks in certain regions. Sure. Uh, central banks are under uh, assault in certain capitals, certain locations. Do you worry about uh, interest rates too low for too long? And do you worry about the independence of central banks? You know, um, what Europe is experiencing with negative rates, obviously, is really bad. So. Uh, not just for the financial sector, but broadly for the economy. Do, do I worry about too low? I mean, listen, the, the, the Fed's job is to manage the excesses and to prop up the weaknesses in any economic cycle. There's no rule book that they sit back with uh, that Jay Powell's got on his shelf behind him saying, at this point, with this information, you shall do X. There's a judgment call, which is why you have the FOMC. I personally would be more cautious uh, bring rates down because you're using up one of the tools that you have. Um, I've been in that position for the last three years. I've been wrong apparently, according to the market, because the market is continuing to price in a further couple of cuts. I've, at this point, I would probably price in one more cut for the rest of the year, and then I would really sit back and, and watch and wait. As to the Fed independence, you know, the Fed is a phenomenal institution. They're, they're rich in talent. Um, there's uh, they're dedicated professionals. The, the board has operated very independently for a long period of time. This is not the first time there's been political pressure on the Fed. So to be fair to the administration, the rhetoric, this is not the first time that, that the executive branch has, uh, has tried to interfere or influence somehow monetary policy. Um, I, I'm highly confident that the Fed governors uh, will retain their independence. I'm going to ask you the same question with an added twist, $16 trillion worth of negative yielding debt in the world. What is that telling us? Well, I, I totally agree with James. I think it's an issue. I think it's a, a lesson. I think when they did it early on, you know, to save basically what you thought that Europe may come apart with the monetary union, but we don't know. I think they'd be writing books about this in 50 or 75 years, and the benefit of negative rates, if there was one, has huge negatives for savers, for lower income people, for, for investments, for capital markets. I would not buy debt at, at below zero. I, not, never, not in my whole life. I would do anything but buy debt below zero. It's, there's something irrational about it. And the laws, you know, it's one of the great economists did talk about, you know, the rates go from 3% to 2%. That's the same as them going from zero to one. And I just beg to differ. I'm not sure the monetary rules are the same at negative. They were at positive. You know, in aerodynamics, there's this phenomenon that, you know, the wind patterns on, over an airplane wing go, you know, go a certain direction. But over a certain speed, they reverse. And I think you may have a little bit of that here. So getting out of this is going to be an issue. And you also have to ask the why. You know, is it secular stagnation, global growth? No, I think there are a lot of reasons. And it wasn't because of a savings, global secular stagnation. It's because of bad policies, changes in rules and regulations, uh, bad, you know, all around infrastructure, work skills, 
uh, things, things which are hurting global growth, which have nothing to do with monetary policy or fiscal policy. And so I, I think we should be more broader based when we analyze the problem. So I'm, I, it is what it is, and we'll, we'll be able to deal with it. I hope to God it doesn't come here. I agree with James, too. The United States, we're growing at 2%. You know, in the normal environment, that means the short rate should be 3%, the 10 years should be 4 and a half. And it's not. You know, so you said 16 trillion of negative of bonds at negative rates. The central banks of the world bought $12 trillion of debt. That means they took it out of the market, they replaced it with cash, and they all did something different with that cash. And that kind of sloshed all around the world. It obviously had an effect of reducing rates, which had other effects. So uh, it, it's going to be a great lesson for, you know, the future generations to learn what to do and what not to do. Just coming back to the deficit thing to sort of pick up this um, thing, but the, you, can, you can get away with large deficits, as, as Jamie said, only for so long. An amplifier of that will be when you stop having population growth or productivity improvements. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the beauties about this country is, and I'm one of the lucky immigrants to it, uh, is that we've had tremendous immigration and successful and better population growth, but tremendous in immigration. If that, if that actually gets clamped down and you're having less, a uh, smaller percentage of the population going into the workforce to support all the entitlements that are coming out the back end, you have both an income problem and an expenditure problem. And a government that is, is if, you, if you play with both of those levers uh, and get it wrong, then, then you've got a whole different ball of wax. The US, has been, the US has been lucky. It's an incredibly vibrant, growing economy and has been for a long time. But there are reasons behind that vibrance. In part of it is immigration and population growth. Yeah, I come back and I just this. So think about this, okay? Because look at the big picture. I would love the economists to take this one up. America has been vibrant, but if you look at an average recovery, okay, over 10 year periods after a big downturn, it should have been 40%. So one of the things we're always asking business, what should it be? Not what is it, not something to change, like what, what should it be? It should have been 40%. It was 40% after 72, 82, 87, 97, uh, the 90s, 97, and 2000. And you know why not 40%? And what's the effect of it not being 40%? So 40% means that today we'd have $4 trillion more a year of income. So that deficit would be far different than that. Two and a half would probably be in, in, in the pockets of citizens. We talked about income, and income's not going to rapidly enough. And and. Also, when you talk about the supply of capital, well, obviously, had that we grown at four trillion more a year, there'd be a lot more capital requests. You probably would have had higher rates, a faster growth. And when companies aren't growing, they need less capital, less for receivables, less for payables, all these various things. And all these things relate to each other. And yet we try to identify one and not the other. And I agree, the reason which held us back is our lack of infrastructure, work skills, our excessive bureaucracy around small business formation, uh, our health care system, which well, is among the best in the world. It's 18.5% of GDP versus 9 for our, our global developing nation competitors, and we don't have that kind of improvement in health. So there are all these reasons why what we're experiencing today, it just doesn't relate to one thing. It relates to a whole bunch of other things. We should do a little better job studying and answering. There are 8 million unfilled jobs in the United States. You mentioned immigration. Are you having a hard time finding and keeping talent? Are you recruiting the type of people you want? We're, we're not, but I, I think the better question is, we survey people all the time. And so there are, now you're getting complaints from people that can't find it. But all different levels, by the way. It's not just, you know, uh, people, uh, starter jobs, but all different levels. That's a good thing. And when we were sitting here three years ago, we would said incomes aren't good up enough, we need more wages. So it's a good thing. And businesses tend to complain when it gets tight. That's why wages go up. The, the problem with the eight million is the mismatch between who they are and where they are and what they're trained in. And again, uh, that's why I say work skills, our education system used to do a great job turning out kids who are job ready, uh, or went to vocational school, or community college, job ready. We don't do a good job of that anymore. Yeah, we, we're not, I mean, we, we don't have a talent issue problem, but that's because we're in major cities and industry that's obviously a well-paying industry. And it, it's really in, it's the mismatch is the problem. Um, but remember where we were when the Fed, when Bernanke initially put out the targets for um, uh, what he do with rates, the target was 2% inflation, trending to 6, I think it was 6 or 6.5% six unemployment. Or at 3.6, 3.7%. It's extraordinary. It's, it's actually quite extraordinary. And th there's no surprise that there's now starting to be wage pressure. There's starting to be, and I'm hearing from 
uh, other CEO clients, that they're, they're having pressure filling jobs that need to be filled. And again, I come back to immigration is a big part of this. You've you got, you got to keep the pipes moving. So if their costs are going up in terms of labor, are they able to pass those prices on to consumers or do they have an absorbed that in, in uh, margin compression? Well, if you, look, if you look at the most recent earnings, the, the earnings have been solid. I mean, so I'm, I'm at individual companies and obviously what's going on in the retailing sector uh, with what Amazon has done to transform that sector. There have clearly been certain sectors and parts of industry that have been affected, but uh, you know, the, the corporate, earnings, corporate earnings remain solid in this country. Let's turn to regulation. There's a perception globally that somehow this administration has deregulated the financial services industry. I hear it wherever I travel around the world. Are you being deregulated? Do you see it? No. Uh, <laughs> look, I, I think there are, I think, first of all, I always say the regulators take a lap, a victory lap. You know, Dodd-Frank did fix the lack of, in certain areas, lack of capital, liquidity, resolution ability. I take Lehman Brothers as an example. It wouldn't happen today. It would have had two and a half or three times as much equity capital. It would not have failed. If it did fail, it would have had 120 million of TLAC, so it would have been the most over equitized firm in the world at the moment of failure. And the FDIC, no one had the legal authority to take it over. Now they do. And they've got the people and the capability and knowledge to manage it. They could fire the board, they could fire management, but the money will keep on moving around the world. Remember, it got locked up in pockets of the world. Lehman simply wouldn't have happened. Now, in addition to that, there were tens of thousands of other rules and regulations put in place. And all the industry is asking for is calibration, coordination, lack of duplication. You know, a lot of this stuff costs clients money, it's not just costing us. And so we've had some. I think it's got to be, there are a lot of more good conversations, the, the tone is better. The, the regulations that people talk about, you know, they're dramatically reducing regulations in banks and fold. These are teeny, weeny little adjustments at the margin that make virtually no difference. They're not backing out all the rules and regulations put in place. So any time you have so many things take place, a rational person look at calibration, coordination, and with an eye, by the way, to maximizing growth. So the fact that we haven't done things in mortgages doesn't hurt me, doesn't hurt JP Morgan. It hurts the ability for people to make mortgages to lower income people. You know, the lack of securitization works. A lot of these things inhibit the markets. They're, they're, we need, in Europe, they need a much stronger capital markets. It was some of the regulations that inhibited the, the, the development of real capital markets. And I don't want to bore people with all the things, but that's in the interest of the European people to have a deeper, wider capital market system. So regulators should work with you know, governments and whoever that cross it to say, let's develop a regulatory system that's the best regulatory system, not just more. And don't look at changing something that's always being bad, you know, a negative. It could be a huge positive for the public good. James, I'll let you uh, piggyback on that, but let me give you a different twist. My current monetary fiscal policy be fueling bubbles, financial bubbles, and do we have the right regulatory structure in place to ensure that if something does pop, it won't have the kind of effect we had in the past? Well, you, you've always got a risk of bubbles. I mean, people, you, you vacillate between fear and greed and the, the bull and the bear instinct, and with cheap money, you're always providing an opportunity for a bubble at some, at some point. Um, I would say, if based upon what we see, certainly in the banking sector, it's very low. I mean, it, 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 just on the regulation point, and we've been living with this, you know, from, from crisis times. What the regulators did was absolutely necessary and the right thing to do. The, the banks were over levered, they were operating with anywhere between 30 and 60 times leverage. They were dramatically undercapitalized, they were using a lot of their balance sheets for illiquid investments. Um, they did not have the kind of risk control structures that, that all of the major banks in this country have. And they didn't have an annual health checkup, which is basically what CCAT does. It kind of checks in like you go to your doctor and every year you go and find out how you're doing your stress tests. Okay, we did well. You know, the, the preemptive stuff, which is capital liquidity, is like maintaining your health, your diet, your exercise. You get an annual checkup and if things go bad, you've got, you know, your resolution plan. Right, the other end, that, that basic structure which I don't think was designed with that complete picture in mind, that, that made enormous good sense to me. So the question is, okay, how much is enough capital? Well, I don't know, let's, let's do at least what you would have needed to have got through the financial crisis without a problem, fair start. And let's dial it up a bit, because things could get worse, fair enough. And let's add a buffer to that, because there are always unintended things, fair enough. And let's add another buffer, because we can. Well, hang on. <laughs> and that's sort of where we are, we're at the hang on moment. Ten years in, 
do you design something which is so safe? You know, the, the mandate of the regulators is safety and soundness. If, if, if institutions are uninvestable, they're not sound. Right? So if it's something is so safe it becomes actually unsound. And I think if you're going to drive the economic growth Jamie's talking about, you need balance sheet growth to support a growing... If you have a growing economy and the banks aren't growing, you, you, you will have a shrinking corporate and employment sector. So is it time to make some changes to the dials? Sure. Would we make, if you took 10 people from this room, make exactly the same changes? Probably not. But most people would say the dials feel like they're at that buffer buffer level. Are there some changes to the process? You know, the changes in the Volcker rule were, were, were pretty simple and they get back to, frankly, what Paul Volcker originally conceived of. Um, the qualitative tests that the, the CCAR uh, Federal Reserve had, not doing that full qualitative test. That makes sense. You do an annual supervisory letter. That, that meets the test. So I, I'm, I'm not at all for, for junking the regulatory framework we have. It worked. It's good. It means banks are in a much more prudent capital liquidity position. The question is, when is enough enough, and how do we use that? Jamie, we had a hiccup in the repo market. Uh, you've been on the record of saying it's an issue of providing liquidity. How do you see, is, is, that, is that a regulatory issue, or is it a market issue, is it a plumbing issue? It was a little bit of both, but, but it is an example. I'm going to tell you why when you talk about coordinating between different policies, that you want liquidity in the system. And the liquidity in the system today is literally, if I think as accurate, is like $4 trillion. That's how much liquid assets the banks hold between deposit the Fed, repo, treasuries, and a smattering of other stuff. But you're at the point where that $4 trillion can never be used for anything else. Okay, so what happened with the repo thing is kind of instructive. That banks in the old days would have in their checking account the Fed very little money, money coming to all day long, and they wanted more money so you never had a negative balance. We always had negative balance to the Fed during the day. We'd send money out to all of you, you'd send it back to us by the end of the day. Our Fed account, our checking account was a small plus. Now, JP Morgan alone has $120 billion of the Fed. It goes down to 60 during the course, but back to 120. So I, I agree, liquidity is critical. Absolutely. I believe it my whole life, you know, but why 120 to 60 or 120? Because other rules um, around resolution recovery and something called CLAR, which is stress testing for liquidity, said we want you to have enough in that account. And I'm not sure it's what the Fed wanted, but that's what these other rules required, such that you'll never hit zero. And then, of course, we all put a buffer on that because hitting zero, you might have some form of punishment and we didn't want to be punished. So, and we may have made the wrong interpretation. It's, it's possible, but I think we all were approximately in the same place in this. So once people, and at one point had excess excess, but once that got down to the point where we're now meeting our own requirements for resolution recovery and stuff like that, it doesn't matter what the repo rate was. We couldn't take any of that account and move it over. I would have moved the whole 120 billion, all of it. Sure, we like making money for nothing. You know, it's just easy to do. And then the Fed had to come in, into it. So it was technical. Why did it go down? Repo is kind of technical, and you know, people have big corporate checks to go out and tax payments to go out, and the Treasury balance, the Fed drop, and all these. So, so it was technical. But but the banks hit that limit; and they couldn't redeploy liquidity. The same issue will happen eventually in what I call the big liquidity thing, which is the four trillion. Which is that's a little bit red line too. Which is when these markets get rough. Which they might, the other keep in mind. These were not rough markets. These were very healthy markets that had their repo issue for a technical reason. For markets to get tough, you have the same issue about the ability to intermediate. And if you're locked up on the ability to do that because of literally a multitude of regulations, I won't go through them, that might cause more consternation in the market, which you don't want. Because these things were set up in a very rigid way and they weren't coordinated between the various worlds. And they should be. So we've, we've spoken to our regulars, and I think they're, I agree, I think they're quite right. And, will look at this and they should do it before the crisis happens, because it will happen. James, uh, one of the objectives of the regulatory framework was to move s some risk out of the banking system into the non-banking system. Have we moved risk into places that we can't see, it's harder to identify? I mean, I think um, it's not a, there's not a binary, Tim, of a yes or a no, that the, you know, in some ways the system, uh, system is efficient. The, the very sophisticated investment firms that happen not to be bank regulated depository institutions are absorbing a lot of that risk, be they um, uh, BDCs, hedge funds, private equity firms, um, 
other investment vehicles that have been have been set up. So I, is that does that cause me discomfort? Not really. I mean, sophisticated investors, well advised, um, taking risk out of the balance sheet of the banks and frankly ensuring we have a healthier and uh, safer banking system. I, it doesn't bother me. I mean, there are, there are other areas, whether it's clearing houses, whether it's um, uh, cloud service providers, there are lots of other things that have evolved since the financial crisis that you could argue um, that's where that's where the, the sort of hidden, it's always the risk that you don't know about. Anything we're talking about today is not something that's going to cause the problem. Right. It's, it's the things, the unintended consequences from the way industries evolve and morph. And that, that's, what, that's what I think of why cyber is so important across not just the banking sector, but the whole system. I'm going to turn to technology with one last question for you. Over the last few years, you've talked passionately about the, the, the drop in the number of publicly held companies. Why has that happened? How can we uh, resuscitate public markets? Yeah. I agree with you about the shadow bank, but the only, the, the only thing is it's also starting, it's growing rapidly. So if you're regular, I agree, it's not an issue. It's a perfectly normal market thing that people do it, but you so much to keep an eye on it. We do it like a shadow banking book report, so we try to make sure we understand the risk. And we lend to shadow banks, because we obviously were concerned about that too. And um, you know, the question was- About, uh, about public markets. And, and I agree that financial utilities is, it's amazing. We've gone in this country from 8,000 to 4,000. And I don't think as a matter of public policy, that's a good thing. So if you look at other countries, they're going up. And, and of course, I'm, and I'm not against private equity. A lot of it ended up in private equity. Some was in consolidation. The 4,000 companies are bigger. It's hard to figure out exactly why. I suspect because, and again, I'm in favor of good corporate governance, but you know, when shareholder meetings end up being a farce, when litigation is can be just crippling to certain types of companies, you know, when when boards of directors are spending all the time, and if you don't believe me, talk to any one of them, crossing T's and dotting the I's, as opposed to talking about the business problems, the business issues, operational issues, strategy, major risk, which is cyber, I put in that category, then people, it's just it's just easier to be private. So if you actually interview people, they say, much better, and they, they can compensate, you know, they can specialize compensation that's not in the eye of the public, who has a different view of how, you know, you maybe should compensate someone. And I think it's, I think we are driving companies to the private market. If we could, I would go private if I could. You know? Like, I, I think being a public company has real negative downsides to it, and, and so it, sh it shouldn't be that way. You know, it, it takes away the ability of the public to invest in companies, right. and, you know, it takes away, because they can't invest in some of these other vehicles, so I think it should be looked at very, very, very carefully, and then we should have a public policy debate around how do we want public companies to be governed, do we want more or less, because this trend has been going on now for a long time. You know, I, I would I would say it's it's it, it's sort of the confluence of a lot of things. It's there's there's a lot of money available through through um, professional industry that wasn't around effectively 40 years ago. I mean, it, it was still relatively small 20 years ago. The private equity space, and there is a lot of money going in that space. Secondly, as you get slower economic growth, companies like ours looking for ways to grow are going to be buying other institutions, both public but also taking public companies out of the market by buying them, but also companies that would have gone public by buying those. And thirdly, as, as Jamie said, it's, it's a burden to be a public company. There, there are some joys of it. You have more, you obviously have um, uh, more liquidity uh, with your ownership structure. You have, in, in many regards, more credibility. You're, you're, um, you're vetted by institutions like the SEC. So there, there are obvious positives that come and give you credibility as an institution. Um, and the negative, you know, we just, as you kicked it off today, Tim, we, we just finished our earnings report. I, I don't know how much time Jamie's team spent on it, but it's, it's a lot. And, you know, the funny thing about quarters, they come around with an alarming frequency, you know. <laughs> and, and I haven't figured out a way to stop that. So, you know, why, why wouldn't we just report revenues every three months and do a full earnings release every six months? Would the world be really worse off for that? So there's a lot of, and the shareholder meetings, you know, we have more security guys in our shareholder meetings than shareholders. Well, actually, they're shareholders too, so. But it's kind of insane, right? You're sitting there talking to three people, and maybe you get a lot more people coming here. It's probably do. Um, out there in Westchester, if anybody wants to come, you know, uh, it gets all lonely up there. But the, 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 there are certain things that are anachronisms of the way business was done 50 years ago. We need to move a little more modern and I think that would help. Speaking of modern technology, between the two, you probably spend 20 billion a year on technology. 
Are you engaged in a technology Jamie's arms race? Jamie's going to spend a lot of technology then. <laughs> what is your tech? We're about 12, 13 billion. 11 and a half. 11 and a half billion a year. We're four. Yeah. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Is it a tech arms race? Are you spending because you feel like you have to for defensive purposes, offensive purposes, and you, you feel like you're getting good value for the 11 billion you're getting? Yes, first, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it, it's, it is what it always was, which is technology has been at the forefront of us changing things for customers and offering more, better, faster, quicker, cheaper. That's been going on my whole life. You wouldn't have mutual funds if you didn't have mainframe computers. And so these things have been adopted, and of course the benefit is the customer, cost of doing business is coming down, you get automatic services, real-time X, uh, data with your thing, APIs, you, know, you can buy and sell things in your phone, you can get information on you can move money all around the world. So that, that is competition. And so that part's new. The part that's different, okay, is that it's, it's faster now. It's AI is real, digital is real, cloud is real, and it's really faster. You can organize around it differently. So, you know, in the old days, you might have a big statement system that had 100 inputs and 100 outputs, and you would kind of do a release once a quarter. Now you have, you know, you modulize it, and you can take a piece of it and just, they're, they're changing every week. You know, and so we and we have great products and services that we give people all the time that are part of a big system, but you can change that screen, that flow, that data. You can personalize it, you can customize it, you can make you know, you can design things the way you want. So it's still true, we have to do this to do a better job for a client. The difference is it is faster, tougher, you can organize differently, there will be different winner losers because of that, but but the the using technology to do better, that's that's been my whole life. James, you, you noted that it creates new risk, cyber risk, uh, moving to uh, cloud service providers. Are these new infrastructures, critical infrastructures, that need a regulatory regime put in place? I'm not sure I'm going to advertise, <laughs> recommend new regulatory regimes um, uh, on the stage. But listen, the, um, it's in everybody's interest. We, we, we'll put more stuff in the cloud. Uh, we're managing more data, we're investing in big data, we're investing in AI, we're investing in all the machine learning, robotics, all of the things that you need to be. And for sure they need, I, I don't know that it's regulatory framework so much as common standards. Um, and I think that's, that's starting to, you know, starting to come. Um, we're, you know, we've been as, you know, we're not a technology company, but in technology infuses everything that we do. We started doing electronic trading and equities in the 90s, basically gave birth to that industry, it has worked its way all through the uh, fixed income space. Um, that what, what is different, you know, as Jamie said, is, is the, the pace of change is spectacular. Um, the amount of attention the fintech sector has created, because, you know, technology goes where the money is. It's like Willie Lerman, you, you know, you, you go to where the money is and, and the banking financial system has a lot of money swirling around it. So there's enormous opportunity to make more efficient and more productive. There's no reason why we can't adopt that ourselves. We are. We're both buying these companies, working partnership with these companies, and, and where we can build the talent and capability ourselves, we do it. The, the war for talent and technology has changed dramatically in the last 15 years from what it was. You know, I think the banks would have had their first choice. For a period of time uh, post-crisis, they were the last choice. Now it's come back. It's much more, we're much more competitive in the marketplace. So there, there is a huge number of dynamics in this, but this has been going on, you know, for 40 years. It's just, it's just accelerated with the incredible innovation coming out of the fintech sector now. One new is cyber. We've mentioned resiliency, data usage, privacy, the conversion to the cloud. These all are additional risks. But just the, the financial market utilities, they should, in my opinion, for a reg regulatory regime, but they should be stress tested the same way the banks are. In a lot of ways, we concentrated a tremendous amount of risk there. So think about derivatives. We said derivatives, derivatives, bilateral, bet. It was more like a spider. Think of a spider web. Lehman was one thing. When Lehman went down, no other company went down because of derivatives. The spider web kind of worked. We've now concentrated a huge amount of risk in some clearinghouses, which if one of these financial market utilities goes down, that's a whole different thing. And they are thinly capitalized. And, you know, of course, they're, some are backed up by us, which is, creates another is, issue for some of the things. So they should have the disciplines to be doing that right. And I believe that Dodd-Frank gave the regulators the right to, that's under their umbrella. And I think they should spend more time with them than with us. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jimmy, one technology innovation that's getting a lot of headlines is Libra. Do you have an opinion on Libra? Sustainable, not sustainable, real, not real? 
It was a neat idea that will never happen. <laughs> and I have nothing else to say about it. <laughs> and we, by, we already have stable coins, so they're, they're not the first to do that. So you have a JP Morgan stable coin? We have a JP Morgan stable coin called JP Morgan coin. It's, it's backed by a dollar, so it's really stable, and uh, so... Um, <laughs> And do either one of you worry about competition from, and I, I hear this from, I heard at our board meeting yesterday, from internet platform companies that can scrape your data. It's an asymmetric relationship. They can use bank data, especially in Europe. They can use bank data, enrich it, and uh, use it for their purposes. The banks don't have the same opportunity. Are you worried about internet platform companies taking away market share in any form? Or well, there are two different issues. Yes. These companies are great competitors. They should come on. They're called capitalism. Some are good. Some are not good. Some will do well. Some won't. And obviously, we should be competing with them on a, on a level playing field, stuff like that. People who are taking data from – now, you all know this, but a lot of you gave your bank account to someone many years ago. You gave it to them for a reason, but they may still be coming in and taking your bank data every day and all of it. It, that should not be allowed. So we, we've sued people over this. We've blocked people down. We will not allow it. We, we've put in place a system which I think it sh everyone should kind of do, which is you're, we're going to tell you what data is being taken by whom, and you have the right to turn it on or off. So you control it. We're not saying they shouldn't do it. It's just you should know what it is. And, and so we have actually have deals that have been inked with several of these uh, screen scrapers that do it the right way. And also, they don't come into our system, so they don't have your bank pass code. They get permission to get the data. We push the data to them. So they don't have unlimited access to your bank accounts. There are safe and secure ways to give people the benefit of aggregation and stuff without you not knowing what it is, where it is, and if you have access to your bank account. If that money is taken out of your bank account because it's aggregated in their proper controls around your bank account, they may very well be liable, not us, which means your money's not money good. So just keep that in mind. James, are you concerned about internet platform companies that, that engage in financial intermediation-like activities but have a different rule book? I mean, I, you know, as, as Jamie said, listen, we're we're in a we're in an open capitalist world. It's a competitive world. You 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 take all manner of competitors. We had you know back in uh, 30, 40 years ago when when the online brokerage business started, right? Which um, was, by the way, it was a, a plethora of many many companies. It's now basically three. That's the other thing is, in, in this industry, you need scale in almost everything you do. There's a reason that institutions get very big. Just the resiliency, the cybersecurity, the operation support, the risk management, all of these things drive scale. So you, you, you see consolidation going on. And listen, we, we take all competitive. We worry particularly about, in, in our set of businesses, it's probably less relevant than um, uh, what Jamie's doing, with dealing with, you know, hundreds of millions of consumers around the world. But, um, uh, you know, we, we rely upon our expertise and, and our brand, our capability, and we've got to have best-in-class data management. We've got to be as good and better dealing with our clients' data than anybody on the outside could possibly be. And shame on us if we're not. Both of you just use the word capitalism. Let's talk a little bit about that. Jamie, you're the chair of the Business Roundtable, one of the most prestigious organizations around. It's incredibly well run, great work. You've just come out with a change in policy, been in place for a long time. The Wall Street Journal uh, editorial page has attacked you as selling out to the left. Elizabeth Warren said, if you really believe in what you've said, uh, you'll vote for her bill, you'll codify it. Uh, she's attacked you as being insincere. So if you're being attacked from the Wall Street Journal editorial page in Elizabeth Warren, are you, have you got it right? Absolutely. Uh, the BRT, first of all, I think these large institutions have been great institutions in terms of how they treat their employees. Most of us give medical and dental and retirement and gyms and training and advancement and the first rung in that job, you know, leads to these great jobs over time. And we take great care of our uh, customers. Obviously, you fail in our society if you don't. Doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. And all of us do community-related stuff as if you were a small-town store. You take care of the local, you serve in a local little league or religious institution. Uh, so we all do a tremendous amount of training and jobs and working with mayors and governors and presidents around the world and prime ministers to do a great citizen. So this, but the statement we had before said, basically it was fiduciary responsibility, which the American public hears is legal, and primacy is shield of value, which the American public hears is rapacious short-term profit-taking. 
And that's not really what we do. So it was an evolutionary statement. And we didn't get rid of shareholder value. We said shareholder value and customers and employees and uh, uh, communities. No different than, and, and someone wants to make it simpler than that. It doesn't have to be simpler than that. If you fail at any one of those, you're probably going to fail. So there's nothing wrong with saying you need a quarterback and a running back and a defensive line. You need all of them to succeed and to say this one measures against that. We're going to weigh and measure them and stuff. So I think the Wall Street Journal, is, in my view, is confused between how we speak to the American public with this simplistic thing about shield of value. We still have a fiduciary responsibility. We still want long-term show the value, but these are the key ways you get it. And we're telling the American public the truth to say that we are devoted to doing these things well. And you know, on the, the left that says prove it, well, honestly, we already do a lot of those things. And I think it gives people a chance to talk about all the great things we do. And we could acknowledge things that don't work in society. So a lot of, you know, when I hear people talk about it, even the Democratic left, it's okay to say they're kind of right about X. Our inner city schools didn't work. They did not work as us because of big companies. I, that's just not true. But we can be more involved in that. It, 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 income inequality, that's true. It's gotten worse over the years. We've studied it in many different ways. And there were things we could do to help that. And there are policies that can help that. So I think we should be engaged in making society and the world a better place. But the, the notion that socialism, OK? And let me just real quick, I know I'm taking too much time on this, but free market capitalism, free enterprise, and freedom are inextricably linked. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and freedom of enterprise are capitalism. Okay, And the notion that somehow the governments, the Constitution was written to say that all the rights belong to you, the individual, other than these given to the government. Because what they were afraid about was a government that took control of everything. And you know, governments taking control of assets and companies, they start to use companies for one thing only, keeping themselves in power, using the company's assets to get votes. Okay, and these companies erode over time, and you do end up with Venezuela. Look at any single one of them, is that they're, 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 these companies get polluted over time. So we can acknowledge and fix what goes on in a corporation. If you say Sweden, Sweden is a, bigger, so is a bigger free market than the United States. If you analyze the more of the assets they are owned by, by the uh, private sector, they're very tough on it. They've got a better safety net than we do. They take better care of the people. I think we can do that too. We should analyze our safety net. We should fix it. We should improve it. We should probably have a negative income tax. We should improve our city schools, improve all these things. But, but uh, that social democracy is not socialism. And so, you know, it depends on how the battle plays out, what they really mean. But controlling companies is socialism. James, you signed the BRT letter as well. Obviously, you're taking care of your customers, your, uh, your, your vendors, and the whole ecosystem within which you operate. Is it a communications problem? Do we just not do a very good job of telling the story of the, being a community, a good uh, community citizen? You know, maybe I, I, um, I had a pretty simple view of this, which is this is what we do. Why wouldn't you sign it? I think all but seven companies signed it. Maybe they had some specific reasons, but it's just sometimes you need to just affirm the obvious. I, I'll give you an example. We have four core values that stand behind our firm, and one of them is do the right thing. Now, my test for a value is somebody else should have the opposite value. Well, nobody's got the value of do the wrong thing. So why do we have it as a core value? Because every now and then, there's enough going on where you've just got to affirm what is the obvious. And with the financial crisis, I felt we needed to affirm the obvious, that in complex financial institutions, when you do the wrong thing, it has catastrophic consequences. So do the right thing. Every day you walk in the building, come in with that mindset. It was sort of the same with this. Of course we're in our communities. We, we, you know, we have the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital at Columbia Presbyterian, and we're proud of that. People are proud of that. We want to be attractive to folks coming out of college. We want our legislators to think we're responsible citizens in, in, their, in their districts and so on. Because you know what? If you're not, banks get nationalized in some countries. But there's no ultimate right to exist. It's up to the population who elect the legislators, who engage the regulators, and so on. That's how the system works. So I felt, you know, what the, the BRT team did, and Jamie and the leadership there, made all the sense in the world. It was, to me, just an obvious reaffirmation of what we do. And by the way, our employees and our clients are demanding we speak out on a wide range of social issues, which I resist. 
the vast majority of, because our job is not to be the chief proponent of every social issue out there in the marketplace, but our job is to be responsible citizens in the communities in which we operate for the benefit of all of those communities. And obviously, if we don't do it right, our shareholders lose. So as a shareholder, and I'm a shareholder, I want, I want that. So to me, it was, it was a, a no-brainer. I, I really didn't understand the pushback on it. I was kind of, you know. I had one little thought. So I think that the view of collaboration and what we can do more to help lift up society, when business, civic society, and government work together, that's what works around the world. And, and are you not concerned about uh, someone trying to measure the difference you're making and somehow coming up with a metric that says, you know, you said you were going to do X, you didn't do X, you were at 0.5X, therefore you failed. How do you respond to those who... But we, so what? We do that all the time. I don't, we don't mind being measured. and Everybody's got their own point of view of what we should do, but we have no problem trying to prove ourselves across those metrics. But you know, the, we're not going, we shouldn't go do what China's doing, but now that it's, they're going to have a social index metrics for every company. I just think that becomes a mistake. I can agree with you there. One of the top topics we are taking on at the I that's just come out of nowhere over the last 18 months is sustainability, green finance, and climate. Uh, climate Week in New York two weeks ago. We had a team there two years ago. We didn't even go to Climate Week. How are you at J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley looking at sustainability from an environmental perspective, we can talk more broadly as well. But how are you embracing this? Well, I, I'm surprised you said it's come out of nowhere in the last 18 months. Uh, For us, it was not on our agenda, and then all of a sudden, okay. we, we, we can't hire enough people to, to fill the needs that we're trying to cover. We, I mean, listen, the, um, uh, I, I spoke somewhere recently, I think it was a congressional hearing, and I was asked about how would the financial system do um, with uh, what's going on with global warming, and I said, you know, a little facetiously, but accurate, accurately, um, if we don't have a planet, we won't have a very good financial system. <laughs> so uh, we, we set up a sustainability institute about seven years ago, uh, led by um, one of our management committee members, who's probably here, Audrey Choi. And, uh, you know, we're, we're interested in it as, as an institution in contributing in a number of ways. Um, intellectual capital about what the actual science is, um, how to help think through um, uh, new forms of uh, energy to replace the old forms and what the right transition period is, how to inform investors on what their choices are, how to create product that give people a choice who only want to invest in E or S or G type funds. Uh, so there's a whole, and now we're doing a major effort around plastics and not just the recovery of plastics from the ocean, but what do you do with this stuff? Right, when you're recovered. Do you turn into bitumen on the roads? And there's some examples where that's been successful. So we, we think we have, we're in a position to add an intellectual voice to the argument in addition to obviously our own personal viewpoints on, on these issues. So uh, this is something that has, you know, every now and then you get, you get surprised. You think everything has a, a, like a slope of the gradient, the change rate. And you think, okay, the slope of the gradient is sort of 4% change rate, and over time, obviously, that, that becomes like that. This has been an exponential change in the last couple of years. The amount of interest from the clients, the way people want to construct their portfolios, um, their level of sustainability investing, is just, it's, it's sort of overwhelming the system. So what is the consequence of that? As, as with... Um, Sovereign Wealth Fund this morning, we were talking about this issue and he described it beautifully. He said it's a bit like um, when you go around the world and you've got to carry a, you know, a little bag full of different light switches. You know, to, your, your plugs, they're all different shapes and sizes. And you go to Japan, it's this, you go to Dallas, you got this, you go, blah, blah, blah. go to Australia, it's about that big, I don't know why. Um, but the, it's, there are no standards. There are standards being set up in different, it, as you said, for the MSCI and, and Standard & Poor's to establish the standards. Um, is it for the rating agencies? Is it, you know, we, we, how do we create not an industry of a thousand industries, but one common language and set of standards to measure and help companies gauge how they're doing on these various metrics? And that's something we can hopefully help with. There is no so it's a huge deal. There's, 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 there's over 200 terms that are used for yep. this, this space. Uh, but this is an explosion that is not going away. This is this will be this is and, and the Scandinavians are ahead of the game on this. The Northern Europeans generally. This this is full on now. We certainly heard it from our board yesterday. Their instruction to me was take it on and run with it. 
How are you doing? I, I agree with everything James said. I would add one caveat, important <laughs> caveat, which is if we want to solve this problem, governments are going to have to take action. Green bonds will not solve it. And it, you know, it just kind of gives people a false sense of security that somehow beating up on companies and you know, doing X, Y, or Z. There is the amount of CO2 put in the earth, uh, the atmosphere is huge. It's got to be global, it's got to be a global treaty, a real one, not a one with no teeth, which the Paris Climate Accord had no teeth to it. Uh, and India and China didn't agree to any limits on that type of thing. You could argue that's true, they're emerging countries, we, and they're, they already do much more pollution in the United States. And the, but the reason that maybe they should be allowed to do more, you have to have a real solution. The real solution, as far as I can tell, is one of, and there'll be R&D, that will really help one day, you know, if we find a new solution, is going to be a carbon tax or with the carbon dividend or an emission thing. All the other stuff is not going to kill it. You want to fix it. So America, and I think the world, we have to take real actions and not actions that make you feel good when you go to sleep at night but aren't fixing the problem. This is only one of two panels over the course of four days where it is all male. How do we do a better job in this industry of putting more women in senior positions and in the C-suite? Well, you, you, you know, I think of it like um, uh, at several different levels. Number one, you need individuals that demonstrate it's possible. So, for example, if, if your board of directors has no women on it and everybody comes in to present to the board of directors, it's a problem. Right? How, how is that not possible? You need senior leadership to show the young folks coming to the firm that it's possible to be successful as a woman. This is not, there's no genetic, no, no uh, talent reason why not. I mean, it's been proven again and again how successful women are against it. men in, in every educational pursuit. Um, so, but the, the, the sort of, and that leads to uh, an unpleasant discussion around tokenism, which I don't like. I, I think it's more a question of finding role models who show it's possible, right? But that's only, that's only the tip of it. What, the way I think about it is, is like planes coming to land at an airport and you've got some at 5,000 feet. Okay, that's the executive team who report to me. Maybe one of them will replace me in this job. It's possible, it's not likely because there are fewer women than there are men in that group. Planes at 10,000 feet, 15,000 feet, 20,000 feet. How do we start working on the 20, 25,000 feet planes and get the women in, in those groups to have the opportunities to develop the skills that you need to be successful at 10,000, at 5,000 and so on? Rather than just saying, what are your needs today? I'm spending a lot of time trying to figure out what, are the, what do we need to do to shape you to be a leader for the future? And what risks are we prepared to take in people's careers to support them in making the important transitions to get out of their comfort space into a new area of the firm to operate where they haven't had the background in it, but we encourage them so we broaden their skill set. So it's a, it's a sort of multi-dimensional, um, you know, many year, this is the first year, for example, we had more women um, as a percent of our intern class globally. I think we had a thousand interns. More than 50% were women, first time ever. There are more women coming out of colleges, by definition, why wouldn't there be more women in the intern class? So it's, and just one last thing on this, a lot of the discussion is around diversity and inclusion. I personally have a little campaign on the word inclusion. I don't like it. I like the word belonging. I want people to walk in a room and feel like I wasn't included. Somebody didn't stand at the door and say, yes, you can come in. It's my room too. Whatever my diverse background, color, gender is, it's my room too. I belong in that room. So it's a culture of everybody feeling when they're in the room inside our building, they belong there as much as I or anybody else belong there. We're just doing different jobs. Jimmy, I'm going to be the last word. Yeah, well, I'm just, first of all, to be a little defensive, banks in general are doing better than real estate, venture capital, law firms, <laughs> uh, Silicon Valley, and all that. And, and this has been an effort for a time. But I, I mean, and, I think they're fabulous. At JP Moore, I think we have fabulous women. Half my direct reports are women, and they run major parts of the company. 30% of the top 250, there will be a female CEO at JP Morgan sometime in the future. What's the next one or not? No, the next one will be who's the best person at the time. You know, and there will be artificial thing. But we have extraordinary women. I'm sure you have a Morgan Stanley. And it's, it's just a matter of time. And I'll note we have uh, uh, our 300 speakers over four days, 43% of women. It's the highest we've ever had. We're going to do better, I can assure you. Let me in just a final minute do uh, uh, something. Uh, I just want to, James, I want to 
commend you and thank you. You've been on our board for seven long years, and your term is up. You've cycled off. I want to thank you for your time and commitment. You've been a great board member. And I still remember the first time I came to see you, and you said, I'll give you all the support I can, and two, you work for the board. The board doesn't work for you. And I w went back to my team, and I quoted you, and I said, that's our philosophy. Uh, we work for the board. The board does not work for us. So you that's, always what board, that's what my board told me. <laughs> <laughs> I, was a, I was a quick study, Tim. <laughs> And I'll say this to, to both of you. I see hundreds of CEOs and chairmen. I meet with leaders around the world. There are very few people that walk me to the elevator when we're done with our meeting. And the two of you always do. And that says something about character. And I want to thank you, Jamie, as well, for all that you do for us. So thank you, both of you and James. Thank you for your board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.